The motion is, this House believes the West has no right to impose environmental standards on developing countries. I look to Jack Woollett, Pembroke College, to open the case for the proposition. Hear, hear. Environmental standards are primarily designed to counter climate change. Yes, they're also concerned with the protection of endangered species and areas of natural beauty. But I shall focus on climate change because without addressing this, the other reasons will cease to matter. Recently, the frequency of climate-related disasters has increased dramatically. We are faced now with 600,000 deaths a year due to these disasters. 95% of those uh, who have lost their lives and will lose their lives are citizens of what are commonly known as developing countries. Climate change will affect everyone on this earth. But it will be, and currently is, those living less stable lives than most of us in the West, who will feel its ramifications most keenly. Those who live lives dependent on the revenue from tourism, those economies are heavily dependent on areas of natural beauty, and those whose homes and cities are often built on low land. In short, those people living in developing countries. No one in Bangladesh needs a lecture on the threat posed by climate change. With 80% of their country situated on a floodplain, they are more than aware of the precarious environmental situation. At the end of 2014, China had the highest installed wind energy capacity. Second place went to America, with just over half as much. China also has the second greatest installed solar capacity and has expressed its commitment to phasing out coal usage and dealing with polluted air. They are more than aware. However, for these countries, such as India, faced with uh, issues such as high infant mortality, which stands at 30 in 1,000 infants, compared to EU levels of 5.7 in 1,000 infants, environmental issues might not always take priority. Yet, despite this, India was ranked 22nd best in the world on the basis of emissions and use of renewable energy in the Climate Change Performance Index 2016. Where do we find America on this list? America, with its dominant position in the West, its supposedly better developed infrastructure and its assertions of having the right to dictate standards. America came 31st. We need less imposed, financially unrealistic legislation and more financial incentives from the West to develop sustainably. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honour to be able to speak to you uh, before you this evening. Furthermore, it's an honour to speak against such a competent opposition. Speaking first for the opposition is a friend of mine and fellow member of the Secretary's Committee, Ms Kriti Joshi. Kriti, um, <laughs> Whilst conducting intel on you, uh, a close friend of yours requested that I publicly beg that you please end your beatboxing career this evening. <laughs> As apparently you think you're really good, but it's just tragic. I'm very sorry. <laughs> However, she is also the only person I know who can persuade Starbucks not to worry because she'll come back and pay later. <laughs> I hope, I hope, it's her persuasive skills we'll be seeing this evening. Secondly, we'll be hearing from Mr. Paul Bledsoe, former figure in President Clinton's Climate Change Task Force and current uh, president sorry, of Bledsoe & Associates, a climate change public policy firm. I will admit that to get ahead of the game, I had a quick browse through your Twitter account. Um, although this was unsuccessful for the debate, I do feel far more informed about your views on Minions and Leonardo DiCaprio. So I thank you for that. Last but not least, we have Professor Bruce Pardy, esteemed author of Ecologic. He's also a lecturer at Queen's University in Canada, and before this, I stumbled upon one student review calling him distractingly hot. <laughs> I just want to reassure you that I think I'll be able to keep my focus on the debate this evening. <laughs> Mr. President, these are your speakers, and they are most welcome.
Imagine a game involving three cups. Under one cup is a ball. Two people each get to pick a cup, and both uh, will win if either finds the ball. Unfortunately, the first player goes and doesn't find it. The cup is replaced, and the second player now has their turn. It's in the interest of the first person to tell the second as much as they can. In this case, the cup the ball was not under. However, the choice between the two remaining cups should be left entirely to the second player. The situation I have just described in this analogy represents the most justified role for the West as we go forward with the climate change unknown. They have lots to share, starting from the mistakes they've made, symbolised by the cup they chose. Furthermore, the West also has lots to offer from the vast, costly research it has conducted. The whole world is united in the same direction with respect to climate change, and no one authority has got the complete key yet. <clears throat> the final choice on climate change should be left to the individual countries, just as in the game, the second player should be able to decide which cup he finally chooses. We all want to go in the same direction, but some cultural things may mean that we want to take different directions and other such factors. So, let's examine why one body would view, uh, would view itself as being justified in having a right to impose something on another. Particularly when, as in this case, those two bodies are groups of countries at different levels of development problematic due to the dangerous assumption that a developed body would be better placed to solve a problem. One body imposing something on another thus implies that the former has a superior opinion or position from which to exert its right. To oppose this motion is to claim that the West does have such a position of dominance over the developing world. Any assertion that the West has a right to impose environmental standard, standards sorry, must necessarily rest on the premise that they have this right because they are in some way justified in exercising control over developing countries. <clears throat> and, as I shall go on to explain, they are in no way justified in exercising such a right. Because, quite simply, Sir. this right is unfounded. Sorry, um, my argument is accumulating. I'd rather wait to the end to hear that if I have time. Thank you for your troubles. There are two bodies under examination here. On one side, we have the West, and on the other, the developing countries. I do not use these labels without acknowledging the potential ramifications of generalizing that this could bring upon. But it remains useful for assessing the balance of power and influence between the two, in order to assert that one group has the right to impose environmental standards on the other. The opposition must prove to all of us that the West has some superior position, some greater understanding of climate change, some justified authority. However, as I shall prove, this is in fact fantasy. The West was originally a theoretical conglomerate based upon the nations of Western Europe and America. Today, it is seen as a group of developed countries, described primarily by their GDPs per capita and sharing broadly similar political systems. If we take the example of America, significant as the most populated and largest of Western countries, then it becomes really rather difficult to justify this supposed environmental superiority on the West's part. Many official statistics <clears throat> on examples of environmental harm, such as CO2 emissions, do not take into account varying population sizes. America produces the 12th largest amount of CO2 per person in the world. <clears throat> uh, according to the UN Statistics Division. If we examine this list, <clears throat> um, if we examine this list, nowhere above America do we find any of the large developing countries. People are often so quick to blame for climate change. Indeed, India can be found at 133rd and China at 55th. CO2 emission statistics alone do not prove overall that the West is more harmful to the environment than these developing countries. Again, sorry, I'm building, but um, if I had time, I will see you at the end. Um, sorry, I've just lost my place. Now. What they do do, sorry, is go more than far enough in dispelling the myth that the West can claim some level of superiority to be able to impose, impose environmental standards on developing countries, as though they are some paternal hand dispensing wisdom and rules to lesser bodies. Indeed, as I, opened, uh, as I mentioned sorry, in my opening remarks, 
developing countries are very much aware of the potential ramifications of climate change. I'm not seeking to solve the issue of China's large emissions. I just need to justify to you that it is not right for the West to dictate the required standards to do so. Sir. Again, same reasons. Thank you. <laughs> Climate change and harm to the environment does and will continue to affect us all. That is why, with this motion, we are not suggesting that the West completely ignore developing countries. We, as a global community, should very much be working together to conduct research and introduce measures. The issue here is with the West asserting that it has a right to impose such measures on developing countries. I have proven that such a right is entirely unfounded. Instead, the West, as a body which is generally more able to devote more research to environmental matters due to greater development in many areas, such as healthcare, has a duty to share these resources and research with developing countries. A duty. A matter then not of right, but of an obligation for humanity. I have proven why the West has no right to impose such standards. But, you may ask, what about the continuing problem of climate change and developing countries' role in contributing to it? In response to this, I return to my earlier analysis of just how skewed many people's perception of what their proportional environmental harm actually is. Moreover, I would like to highlight the numerous examples of these countries being involved in international forums such as the UN's 2015 Climate Change Conference, commonly known as COP21. These countries were heavily overrepresented at this conference. Google the terms developing countries and the environment and you'll find numerous horror stories, horror stories sorry, of pollution and harm. Look a little bit further and you'll find the examples I have given you of cooperation, of awareness, of sustainable energy and growth. The stigma towards the developing world is based around a fear of the future. If unchecked, where will we be in 20? 30 years from now. If we all continue the work begun over the last few years primarily, I believe we will stop climate change. No Western superior moral platform from which to impose environmental standards can be found. And as I have shown, none is needed. Thus, the West has no right, no right at all, to impose environmental standards on developing countries. Now, as a final thought, I'd like to leave you something else. Well, if we give the West the right to do this, we then run the risk of certain things such as the abuse of this power. Take, for example, nuclear energy. Nuclear energy, uh, nuclear energy is a force for good. Look at France. They use nuclear energy vastly to deal with less CO2 emissions. But America and the West are scared of this technology falling into the wrong hands, rightly, because the ability to develop nuclear weapons. Would that then cause the West, maybe, to form legislations that maybe stop people developing technology such as this for a fear of something else? And can we allow that? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.